Do you know your story? What if there's so much more to discover than you could possibly imagine? So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Do you know your story? So I'm guessing you are probably a whole lot like me during this whole COVID-19 season, these 17 years that it's felt like since March, right? You've watched maybe a lot of media, a lot of television. For me, I like to watch movies. I love Netflix. I like television movies. I am, I don't have to have a new movie. I love like reruns of movies that I've seen. I'm a big leftover guy. Love going to the refrigerator, grabbing some leftovers, throwing a little, little like dash of salt on it. It hits it with flavor and then eating it and watching a movie that I've seen before. And this just like, like happened to me recently. I was watching The Book of Eli. Have you seen that movie? Great movie. And I was watching it. And as I watched it, a rerun time, I've seen it before. I had this like epiphany, like this boom, aha moment pertaining to this new series that we're in called The Story. So spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the book of Eli, you might want to put some earmuffs on. You see, the book of Eli, it has Denzel Washington starring in the movie, and he is Eli. And his job, his mission is to get this special book to a special destination. And the whole movie line and plot is about him like fighting people off and persevering through hard times and eventually, like in a manner of speaking, getting that book to the destination. But The cool thing is, like two things, spoiler alert, here here they are, right? The book that he has to get there, it's actually the Bible, right? Of course, I would choose that movie, This Is Church, right? He gets the Bible to this destination. And here's like the second spoiler alert is that all throughout the movie, get this, Eli, Denzel Washington, is blind. And you don't know that until the very end of the movie, Now, I remember the first time I watched that movie, I was like, wow, this is incredible. What a twist. And and the Bible that he was protecting was actually a Braille Bible. So it was so amazing. But when I watched the book of Eli again on a rerun on television, like, like I now knew the full story. And when you know the full story, your eyes see so much more. It's like a set of keys unlocking secrets and important things to pay attention to and perspective that wasn't there the first time when you really didn't know the story. You see, now that I knew that Denzel was playing a blind character, the movie was that much more amazing. It's like all of a sudden, it made more sense. You ever seen The Sixth Sense? Same kind of thing happening in that movie. Like you don't realize it to the end, Bruce Willis is actually dead the whole entire time. It's like this aha moment, right? Have you, have you ever seen Fight Club? Like the, the one character in there, uh, he's the guy a lot of people say I look like Brad Pitt, right? You see it now? I know, you were thinking, no, you actually look like Danny DeVito, not Brad Pitt, right? That's okay, that's okay. But Brad Pitt's character in Fight Club, Tyler, he's a figment of Edward Norton Jr.'s imagination the whole entire time. And there's this thing that happens when you realize the bigger story, it makes the moments make more sense. See, that's the reason we're doing this series called The Story. is because all of a sudden, when we know the story, the story of God is what I'm referring to, The moments in our life that are difficult and uncertain and filled with like, how am I ever going to get through this? Those moments, they make more sense. You know, the Bible is an absolutely incredible book and gift that we have. And many times we don't always understand the depths that that it took to pull this incredible piece of work, this story of God together so that we could have it today. 
Like, like if, you don't, if you don't know this, the Bible has 66 different books that are compiled together in the Old Testament and the New Testament to, to be one big Bible. 66 different books. And those 66 books were written by 40 different authors. That's incredible, right? 40 different people. Many of them didn't know each other, right? 40 different people, 66 different books. And, and, and amazingly, like it was compiled in three different languages, that like blows your mind. And then here's like the biggest kicker that makes me feel like, wow, the Bible is actually, actually absolutely incredible. It was compiled over the course of, get this, 1,500 years. Like that's a long time. And what amazes me is over the 1,500 years and the 40 authors and the different books in the three different languages, the one main inspiring author, God, was actually telling one big story. That's why this thing called the story, when we know it, the story of God, helps our life make more sense. Now, if you understand the narrative of, of Genesis all the way to maps, there's four main parts of this thing called the story of God. There's creation. Creation is Genesis 1 and 2. It's the opening sequence where the earth is created and there was light and darkness and Adam and Eve are formed. And then just one chapter over in Genesis 3 comes the second section, the second stop in the story of God called the fall. It's when Adam and Eve made a choice and there was a serpent and a piece of fruit. And then later on, years later, when Jesus is on the scene, there's the third part of this story of God, the thing that if we know this, our lives make more sense. The moments of our life make more meaning for us and our kids and our generation. The third part is called redemption. And then the fourth part, ultimately referring to heaven and what's life like later in the kingdom of God now, it's called restoration. See, that's the story of God, the story we're living through. And I say it this way, that, that we're living through it because we have to realize that our lives are part of something bigger. Like your moments, the good ones, the hard ones, the fun ones, the things you take pictures of and the things you don't ever want to talk about again, all of the moments of your life and of my life, they don't exist on their own. They're actually a part of something bigger. This, they're, they're existing connected to a grander narrative that's revealed through the scriptures. And that's what we're going to talk about in this series. Over the course of four weeks, we're going to study creation and fall and redemption and restoration. And when we know the story, we can understand our moments. Now, today I want to kick off week one. I want to study and look at the, this moment called creation, Genesis 1 and 2. And now, now, granted, there is a lot of writing about these two amazing full chapters in the Bible. There is a lot going on in the very first two chapters. And I, and I have to confess, I can't cover every little bit of what's going on there. There are volumes written, commentary after commentary written in terms of what actually is going on at the very, very beginning. But what I want to do is I want to talk about just a little bit of, 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 I'm calling it some of what is revealed in Genesis 1 and 2. Just, just a little bit, two, two things that I believe are revealed that if we know them, our moments will make a whole lot more sense. Now, most times, whenever we study like the beginning of time, in the beginning, we often look at it from a scientific lens. We want to focus on like, so how did that happen? And what was, what was first? And what was second? And when did the dinosaurs fit into this whole story? And look, 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 those are all great questions. Those are valid, important things to discuss and to dissect. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Because I think there's a very, very unique angle that's revealed that we can often miss if we're not careful. Let me put it to you this way. When I was in 10th grade, I had this, this teacher. He was, a, he was a history teacher. And I went to a small school district. So you sort of knew all of the teachers while you were in middle school and you knew a little bit of who they were and you heard some things and you sort of started to form some opinions about them before you actually ever even met them. You know what I'm talking about? You sort of uncovered a little bit of their reputation. Well, when I was in like seventh and eighth grade, I had started to hear some things about this teacher. I started to hear that he was actually crazy. Like in class, I heard that he would throw chalk against the wall and explode it if he didn't like your answer. 
right? I remember driving around with my mom in the car. He lived nearby us, and, and I would see him in the summer. He'd be cutting his grass, and he would wear a hard helmet in the middle of summer. And I'm like, what, what is going on? What, what is this guy up to? I even heard a, a story one time of how he, he like actually hit a, a player of his. He was a basketball coach, and, and I'd heard all this stuff, and of course, I'm like, I'm nervous to have him in 10th grade, right? I'm thinking like, who wants to have a teacher that's crazy? I'm, I'm afraid of him. I don't want to get yelled at in class. I don't want to get hit with like fragments of chalk as they hit the wall. And, and eventually, I, I had to take him. I took him for, for two, diff- two, two different classes in the same year. And what was interesting was what I experienced was different than what I had heard. Now, granted, he was a little bit... Um, Passionate, I'll say. I won't say crazy. I'll say passionate. One time he was teaching class and he got excited about a point. I think we were talking about the, the country of Russia and he was talking about something and he took his glasses off and threw them in the air. And I was sitting in the front row and I watched this happen. They came down and landed on a table and a lens popped out of the glasses, right? And so the next period comes. I told you I had him for two classes in a row. He went and picked up between classes. He picked up his glasses and put them back on, but he never put the lens back in. He taught an entire class with one lens in and one lens out. My point is this. There's a difference between reputation and reality. He quickly became my favorite teacher in high school. See, I think we've got to understand the difference between reputation and reality when it comes to God. See, a lot of times we form our image of who he is and what he's up to based on things we've heard. We have people in our life, they might be our mom or dad, they might be an authority figure, they might be someone we look up to like an athlete or, or a movie star or someone important to us and, and we hear them talk about God and we, we sort of cement what they say as who God really is, but do we ever take time to look at the reality of what the scriptures reveal? Because there is a difference between things we hear about God and the reality we read about God especially in Genesis 1 and 2. See, that's my, my, my big thing for, for today as we kick off this series. I, I know like, like there's a lot going on in Genesis 1 and 2, but some of what is revealed is simply this, who God is and what he does. We can get caught up in how creation happened, but let's not miss what it tells us about the creator himself. You see, in the opening of scriptures, God gives us a glimpse of the almighty creator of everything. And get this, it's an amazing picture. Here's five things that I, I see about who God is and what, he, what he's up to. The first one is this. When you, when you read the creation narrative, the account in Genesis 1 and 2, you see very, very quickly that God is all powerful. He, he's more powerful than Thanos with the jewels. And the, and the snapping of the finger, right? Like all God has to do for, for creation to happen is speak. Eight different times in Genesis 1, the phrase says, and God said, and, and there's amazing things that happen, like light happens, darkness separates, there's, there's water and there's earth and there's animals and there's birds and there's all this crazy stuff that simply respond to the command of God. Isn't that crazy? Do you see how powerful he is? Like he just has to speak a word and amazing beauty and creation happen at the, at the following of his words. That's an incredible God. That's a powerful God. Don't you wish you had that power in your house with your kids? I do. I wish I could just speak and things would happen, but they don't. That's who God is. And what he does is he speaks in good, beautiful, creative things result. The second thing that I see when I look at the creation account, specifically Genesis chapter one, I see that God brings order out of chaos. It's almost like a specialty of his. He brings order out of chaos. So about 12 years ago, when I, I lived in Ohio, my wife and I, we lived in Ohio, and our, our oldest son, Nico, was, was around three years old. And, and you got to know Nico. He was a really, really verbal kid. He was speaking full sentences at his first birthday party, like, like absolutely incredible. And not only was he a verbal kid, he, he was a little maybe on the loud side. He would be very, very loud around people. And, and, and it wouldn't be hard to hear when Nico was talking. So we're at breakfast one time, my wife and I and our, and our son, Nico, and we're a small 
small little town and it's a little diner and it's like a mom and pop, greasy spoon kind of place. It's great food. And we're sitting there and we had just gotten our food and I was about to take a sip of my coffee and my son declares in his outside voice, right? He declares, look, dad, it's a damn pancake. That's what I did. Like I froze. Like, because I heard clearly what I thought I heard. And, and my first reaction, I'm not going to give him attention because what if he says it again, right? And so I like look around and I see an older gentleman over here like looking at me like, I can't believe your kid talks like that. I'm like, oh, like that sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach because someone had heard. And, and when I looked over here, my son was, was wanting my attention. So he, he like stepped up his game a bit and said it a second time really loud. Look, dad, it's a damn pancake. And I'm like, oh, I look over at him, I'm like, who taught you how to talk like that? And my wife is sitting over here and I'm like, you taught him how to speak, you must speak like, I'm just kidding, she does not talk like that. But those are the thoughts that, that go through your mind because I'm panicking and I'm sweating and I can't believe my son just screamed this in a restaurant. And so finally I took a breath and I looked over at my son and I said, Nico, what, what are you saying? He said, look, the pancake stops the syrup from ever touching my sausage. And I'm like, oh, I'm even louder than him this time. Like, I'm, oh, you mean it's a pancake. Damn. Oh, I get it. You're so smart, right? Like, do you, do you see what happened there? Do you see how important order is? If it matters that much in a two-word sentence, how much more does it matter in your life and in mine? How much does order in our household matter? How about in our finances? How about in our thought life? How about order in our emotions, in our, in our feelings, and how we respond to everything going on in our world? How about order in our, in our social media, in our political world that we're living through right now? Order is so important. And here's what Genesis 1 tells us about God. He is a God who looks at chaos and brings his order to it all the time. We can take it to the bank. It's who he is. And it's what he does. Look very, very early in the creation account. It says this in the beginning, Genesis 1, verse 1. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. That word void refers to an emptiness and a lack of order. It's like this primeval state of earth. It's like the nothing, right? And there was darkness over the face of the deep. Darkness refers to if you've ever been in a spot where there's no ambient light. There's no stars, there's no, there's no moon, it's a cloudy night, it's completely dark and the darkness like envelopes around you, that's what this was like, it was chaotic. Scholars describe it as a sadness, as a place of terror and tension. It was out of order and God said, and order came. See, that's who he is and that's what he does. God looks at chaotic situation and it doesn't matter what the chaos is or where it is and he speaks to it and brings order. Here's the third thing I see about God. He's a provider. God just isn't absent and, 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 and out to go tend to something else. When he creates, he also cares. Look at what it says after he created like humans, us, Adam and Eve. And God said, behold, I've given you. Look at how he provides every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, meaning don't worry ever again about eating. I got you. I've provided for you. It's how I care for you. And to every beast, this is all the animals of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, everything, I've given every green plant for food. God does just not create and then peace out. No, he stays and cares. It's who he is. It's what he does. And he tells us this at the very, very beginning of the story because he doesn't want us to miss it. He doesn't want the rest of the story to overshadow who he is. Here's the fourth thing that I see about God. And these are two sort of biblical theological words. God is transcendent and imminent at the same time. He's not one or the other, he's both. 
He's transcendent, meaning he is not bound by space or time or reality. He exists at the beginning and at the end, and time does not stop him. And, and the scriptures tell us in Genesis 1 that the Spirit of God was hovering over the darkness and over the depth, and, and God is sort of like, like, like he's spirit, and he's from another realm, but at the same time, he's imminent. He's near and intimate and present personally. Scripture tells us that when Eve was created, it says the Lord brought her to him, to Adam. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. So, so God is big and he's mighty and he's everywhere, but he's here as well. And he's near. It's who he is. It's what he does. It's the beginning of the story. Here's the fifth thing that I see about who God is and what he does. And it's quite simply this. God is good. He is good. It's his nature. See, when you look at Adam and Eve and what they experienced, like, like I, I put it this way, our needs, the things that you and I desperately need in life were their attributes. Here's what I mean by that. The things that we need, the things we desperately long for that we'll do anything to get, I'm talking about significance. I'm talking about security. I'm talking about acceptance. You know how we try to perform to feel significant? Adam and Eve didn't have to do that. They were the chief of all creation. God looked at them and said, this is very good. You know, sometimes we try to, we try to control, we try to please people. Adam and Eve didn't have to do any of that. They had purpose. They had a job description. God was near to them. He had provided everything that they needed. So the things that you and I need in life, they already had them. They didn't have to work for them or worry about, will people like me? Or will I have enough for the future? Or have I accomplished enough in my X number of years? The things we worry about and fret over and strive toward, Adam and Eve had them. And this tells me that from the very beginning, God was, and he still is today, intentionally good. This gives us a glimpse of the way God intended it to be and how it will be one day on the other side of this story. He is good. Now, for some of us, you may have known all of these things or have heard them at least in some way, shape, or form before, but, but let me just explain why this matters. Here's why. Because when we forget who God is and what he does, that's the moment we lose hope. That's the moment we grow anxious. That's the moment where peace is nowhere to be found. That's the moment where we start to sweat and we start to fear. When we forget who God is, anxiety and fear and uncertainty and striving and strife and anger and fighting, all of that negative stuff, all those emotions we deal with all the time, when we forget who God is, that's when hope is nowhere to be found. But the opposite is true as well. This is why this matters so much at the beginning of the story, because when I know who God is, I can have hope Despite what I see, in the middle of a virus, in the middle of violent protests, in a time where, where there is inequality socially and racially in our world, in a time period where the political climate is it's just awful to live through. It's, it's anger everywhere and it's frustration and we don't know what is true and what is false. In the middle of all the stuff that we see, we can still have hope when we remember who God is. In Philippians 4, the scripture verse, that's actually, literally, the most searched verse in 2019. It's the verse people most look to often. And I imagine when this year is said and done, it'll be the reigning champ again come 2021. Here's what it says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, there's that peace, which surpasses everything we understand and all that we see will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. See, the Lord is at hand. That's why we don't have to be anxious. And that is our source of peace. The Lord who takes chaos and brings order the Lord who provides, the Lord God who is good, the one who is transcendent and imminent at the same time. He's at hand. So take heart. Do not fear. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but experience his peace. I think it's so important God puts this at the beginning of the story because when we miss it, we lose hope. So may we never forget who God is. And when it's struggle or feels like tempting to doubt it, may we return to the beginning of the story and be reminded of how good and great our God really is. See, that's just the first thing I believe that Genesis 1 and 2 reveal to us. The second thing really is is building on top of that. God also reveals not only who he is and what he does, he also reveals to us what we are supposed to do. Like right in the beginning of Genesis, chapter 1 and 2, we find a bit of a, a job description or a purpose statement for us as humans here on earth. If you've ever wrestled with the question, what's my purpose on earth? Like you might be a college student listening right now trying to figure out like what should I major in and and what's that first career I should move toward. You might be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad wondering like is this what I was meant for? Is this enough? Like we often wrestle with these questions of what am I here for and how should I be doing it? And I can't tell you the amount of times people have asked me and wrestled with this question and wondered should I, should I now get into ministry, right? We often think that, that to please God When it comes to work or vocation, it requires that we are part of the church in terms of paid staff. But everything can change if we look at Genesis 1 and this job description a little bit differently. See, I believe we're all in ministry. I believe no matter what field or stream of influence we're in, whether it's engineering or entertainment or education or business or finance or retail, whatever it is, where we are, there is ministry to be done. But it requires we change our perspective. Check this out. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and he also gave us what I said, a job description. Genesis 1:28. it says this, and God blessed them, Adam and Eve, And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Here's the job description. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Key word right there, subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do we ever stop and realize that God put work in paradise? See, sometimes I miss that. Sometimes I, I forget and I, and I ignore and I often think that work is a curse. Work is a punishment. It's this thing that I have to do to make money. But, but everything changes when I pause and look at it differently and I say, whoa, 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 whoa. God put work. And matter of fact, he worked too in creation with us during creation. He rested from it. But God put work in paradise. You see, work, what we do, nine to five, Monday through Saturday, whatever it is that we put our hand to and where we get our paycheck or, or what we feel we're called to, it may serve as a reminder of the curse, but we must know it's not a result of the curse, nor is it a curse itself. Work is meant to be good. Work is meant to be life-giving for us. Work is meant to be a part of our identity. This idea that we were created in the very image of God, in the image of God, in his likeness, you and I were created. And our work is meant to be about reflecting the creator, how we do our work, more than just what we do for work. See, what would happen if we would change the question? What would happen if we would look at what's going on in our heart and shift that longing around a little bit differently and and stop always worrying, worrying about like, is this the thing that I'm supposed to be doing? And just start wondering a little bit more, am I doing this thing the way God would? See, there is work and calling and purpose everywhere. If we go about it by trying to reflect the image of God, the nature we were created in. See, I believe our purpose and our vocation, no matter where we are, if we're an engineer, or a math teacher, or an Uber driver, or a student, or a stay-at-home parent, or we're working from home, or we're retired right now. It doesn't matter. We all have the same job description. We're about, we're to go about our Monday through Saturday the way God went about creation. You know what he did? He created order out of chaos. See, that's our calling. That's our vocation. That's the way we do things. We step into situations that are chaotic and we bring the peace of God with us by how we talk, 
and by how we don't fear and by how we remember and remind people around us of who God is and that he's here with us. We also act like God and, and, and reflect the creator God by, by caring for everything around us. That means people. See, I don't care where we are or what we do Monday through Friday. There is always an opportunity to care for someone. The creator's creation where we live and where we work and where we play. That's our calling. That's our job description. There is great dignity and worth and fulfillment when we live that out the way God did. And the third thing that I see God doing when it comes to our vocation and and our calling and our work is, is making sure we enhance and beautify Make it even better. Make it even more beautiful. That's why decorating is connected to the purposes of God. That's why planning a party and a celebration and making it as good as possible, if it's for the benefit and use of other people, God's creation, it's connected to the mission and purpose of God. That's what God did with the earth. Day after day after day, he made it even more beautiful and useful. You see, that's what the word subdue means. It means we're to take what is and make it better and more peaceful for all of humanity. That's all of our job description, no matter where we work. There's an author named Robert Bella, and he wrote a book called Habits of the Heart. And it's getting at this idea of vocation, our our Monday through Saturday. You know, we spend the bulk of our life and our time Monday through Saturday. And the scriptures speak a lot about work. Here's what he said. To make a real difference, there would have to be a reappropriation, meaning a rethinking, a, a taking of the way we think about work and looking at it differently of the idea of vocation or calling, a return in a new way to the idea of work as a contribution to the good of all and not merely as a means to one's own advancement. You know why this matters? You know why this part of Genesis 1 and 2, this part of of the story that God reveals to us in Scripture, why it makes sense for our everyday moments? Because when we understand the purpose of work that's established in creation, Monday through Saturday become ripe with potential to change the world. Can you imagine if all of us as followers of Jesus would step into every bit of chaos and bring peace and order? If we would care for every single person around us and view that as our job description, our calling, and if we would go about our work with excellence and creativity and beauty for the benefit of everyone else, not just for the advancement of ourself, what could happen then? Our world would change. It would see the beauty and goodness of this God who loves us and is good and worthy of our worship. You see, our work can be worship if we do it in a way that reflects who God is and the likeness we're created in. This is creation. This is the part of the story of God that helps us make sense of our everyday moments. Next week, we're going to talk about the second part of the story, the fall. But before we do that, I want, to, I want to focus in on something I talked about earlier, three words. Because it struck me so, so, so like tangibly in my life this week as I was prepping. The three words were, and God said. When's the last time you had a word from God himself? When's the last time he spoke something into your soul and into your heart and it did what it did at creation, it changed things. It brought peace and order and goodness and provision and beauty into your world. When is the last time you had an and God said moment? They are to be experienced. God wants and longs to speak to his creator. It's one of the ways he loves and provides for us. But the question is, are we focused on everything else in this world except for hearing from his voice? 
See, I believe now is the time for us to press in and lean in harder to the voice of God and beg him to speak a word to our lives because when he does, things change. The atmosphere changes, our world shifts, and we experience order and peace and creativity and beauty like never before. Three simple words can change our life. And God said, don't you want that in your story? My wife and I had dinner with dear friends recently and, and we were just in awe after the dinner was over. We left and we were talking about their story as they unpacked their life and their, their relationship and their work careers. And they, they kept using this phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said over and over and over again in their story, they had taken time to seek and search and beg for the voice of God to speak because they knew it would change their story. It's time to get an and God said in your story and mine. Would you pray with me? Right now in the quietness of wherever you are, there might be kids running around. The dog might be barking. <laughs> you might be driving and someone is honking. It, it doesn't matter. Just, just take a moment. And, and quiet your soul and quiet the voice in your head and ask God to give you a word. Because we know from Genesis 1 and 2 who he is and what he does. And we know that he's good and he's present and he's beautiful in the way he provides and creates. Father, would you speak to us now? We want an and God said moment in our story. We want to hear the voice of our almighty creator calling out to us in our heart, in our minds, and in our soul. God, would you speak? We are listening. We are eager to experience the transformation that comes with your voice and your voice alone. So Father, please speak. Spirit, speak in our hearts. Give us courage to say yes. Father, thanks for from the beginning of the story making it clear who you are and what you do. And despite all we experience, we can return and remember how good and great you are. God, I'll ask again, speak. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.